So much great work has been done and so much more work to be done. I was here this summer and I was working on the expert committee which was focused on community integration for individuals with disabilities, individuals with intellectual disabilities. We have a report coming out almost any day now in which we talk about how important access will be for people with disabilities as they transition into the community. Am I going too fast? No? Okay. It's, it's always a pleasure to be back in Israel because you have to realize no matter what you think about Americans, we have much to learn from what's going on here. We have many challenges now in America many economic challenges, many social challenges. Most people with disabilities in the United States live in poverty. Most people in the United States with disabilities do not have jobs, do not access the internet, do not have many social activities. And at the Burton Blatt Institute, which I am the chairman of, we work in partnership through an amutah here in Israel on issues of mutual interest. One of the big issues of mutual interest is on accessibility and moving towards what we call, what you call, universal design or design for all, which is really more of the gold standard so that everybody can participate. I was traveling recently in the United States at the request of a very wealthy individual who lives in San Antonio named Gordon Hartman. His daughter has severe physical and cognitive disabilities, and he's an entrepreneur. He happened to sell his real estate company at the perfect time of the market before the crash happened. Very wealthy man. He took his money and started a foundation and built, if you can imagine, in San Antonio, a small Disneyland it's called Morgan's Wonderland. Morgan is his daughter's name. Some of you may know it. And it's totally accessible. So if you use a wheelchair, you go on the car ride the same with your brother or sister or father or mother or child. Same thing with the boats. Same thing with all the activities are totally universally designed. They have a sensory garden. Many of you probably have been to the fantastic sensory garden at Elwyn in Jerusalem. David Marcou is here somewhere. Where is David Marcou? David, David, is, David is walking in. David Marcou. I'm talking about your sensory garden. <laughs> uh, so this is a guy who really put his money where his mouth is. And he is now building this park and building a hotel next to it in which not five rooms because of the law will be handicap accessible, but every room will be universally designed so anybody can stay in any room. This activity grows out of the work I've been doing around the world on behalf of the Global Universal Design Commission. Uh, you know the expression, there's no rest for the wicked. Well, I, I am chairman of the Global Universal Design Commission, which is a very large now na international nonprofit organization, which is developing standards which are voluntary for universal design, for companies, for large businesses, for products, and for technology. I just had the great fortune I miss some of my friends who were visiting Syracuse. I was in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, because Brazil is hosting the World Cup and the Olympics and the Paralympics. They are having hundreds of thousands of visitors coming to Brazil. And we were negotiating with the Brazilian government a very exciting opportunity to build and to make sure 
that all the facilities were going to be not only accessible, but universally designed for persons with disabilities. This is a big challenge in the United States because there's not as many historic buildings, of course, as in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or other cities that you have here. But there's still, as, as Aaron was saying, there still is this terrific attitudinal fight, this barrier many times that people without disabilities feel if they have to make something accessible, it's going to cost them money or it's going to be difficult for them. I heard Aaron talking about captioning and web access, which of course is part of your law. I'm a lawyer. I'm also a researcher, psychologist, so it's kind of a dangerous combination. But I am now co-counsel in a, a large case in the United States with other leading attorneys in the United States, kind of like our Bischut type people. It's called Disability Rights Advocates. You may have heard of them. Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF, you've heard of them. And we are in litigation, for example, against CNN. You all know CNN. Larry King is no longer on CNN. I don't watch the new host, but everybody knows Larry King. CNN, for some strange reason, has decided not to caption its website, its news website, for people with hearing impairments. We tried to get them to caption it. In the United States, CNN's news site alone gets 31 million hits almost weekly. So huge numbers of people are looking at the website, but our clients, which are the organization is called GLAD, Greater Los Angeles Association for the Deaf, decided enough was enough, and they wanted to understand the news and be part of civic society like anybody else. For some reason, and I think eventually we will prevail, CNN has decided they want to fight this very hard. And again, as Aaron was saying, a lot of this is attitudes, I think. Because why would they turn away a million customers in the United States with hearing impairments who want to look at adver advertisements, who want to buy the same sorts of things on the web as anybody else that CNN is selling. Interestingly, CNN is claiming that for them to make their website accessible is not an issue of the rights of people with disabilities. If they were have to make it accessible, it's a violation of their rights because the deaf community would be dictating, would be telling CNN what they would have to say on their website. Of course, this is nonsense. In the United States, we have a constitution, you may have heard of, which uh, is different than Israel or England or other places. And one of the main clauses of our constitution is called freedom of expression, free speech. You all know what that is. For some perverse reason, I don't understand why, CNN is claiming that if they have to caption their website, it's a violation of their freedom of speech because we will be telling them what to say. Again, which is, of course, uh, doesn't make sense. But what it's reflective of, I think more importantly, is this terrific resistance to accessibility, uh, perhaps as you're experiencing or perhaps as you're not experiencing in Israel. In New York City, if many of you have been to New York City recently, they have about, imagine Tel Aviv on a bigger scale, they have about 30,000 taxi cabs. How many do you think of the taxi cabs are handicap accessible in New York City? Close, 138 out of 30,000. So if you're using a wheelchair in New York City and you're trying to wave down a taxi, you can forget it. I mean, you'll never get an accessible taxi unless you can fit into that taxi. There's now litigation in New York by disability advocates to try to change that. And the mayor of New York City is an otherwise very interesting man. He's a billionaire, he's Jewish, Michael Bloomberg. Some of you may have heard of him. But for some reason, they chose a taxicab company that was going to design taxicabs that were not accessible. Again, 
Our position, as I will talk about with regard to not only access but universal design, is that why would you not want to have all these people get to work and be taxpayers? Or to shop in New York City and get to where they want to go to pay dollars that help the economy? It doesn't make sense. But we are still fighting these sorts of issues in the United States. As Aaron was also talking about, there's litigation going on now. Believe it or not, that sidewalk should have curb cuts. You think the United States has the Americans with Disabilities Act? We do. We are very forward looking in many ways. Some cities, though, are saying now they have no money, unlike the cities in Israel, of course. They have no money. And how are they going to pay to make all the curb cuts that are needed in the United States? So this is litigation again that will probably go to our highest court, called our United States Supreme Court, to find out whether or not sidewalks are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now you would think in the United States, 20 years after our law was passed, I know you're phasing in your law, we would not be arguing about these questions. But I think what has happened is, with the terrific downturn in the economy, and frankly, the municipalities are really strapped for money. There's a terrific pushback in some ways on disability issues, and we have to be very careful in the United States. Maybe the same is true in Israel. For the first time that I can remember in the United States, people are questioning deinstitutionalization. For the first time that I can remember in the last 25 years, and a lot of it has to do with ideas about cost, even though the reality is, as many of us know, many providers in the room and, other, and others, that in fact, independent living in the community is cheaper than housing somebody, at least in the United States, in an institution. Now, I don't have too much time, so I want to make a couple. Yes, that's where I was going. Shira said, don't forget universal design. So that's where I was going. Universal design is not rocket science. Some people call it design for all in Europe. And it's essentially, accessibility in some ways is a subset of universal design. Many times, we will create access in a unique way for a person with disabilities, whether it's curb cut, or whether it's web access, or whether it's building design. But the new way of thinking about accessibility, perhaps, is to build in features which help everybody. Universal design, in its purest form, is meant to be equitable in that everybody can use it. It's meant to be simple and intuitive. It's meant to be, uh, have a low physical effort. So many of you have heard me talk about the big Destiny Mall in Syracuse, New York. I come from Syracuse, New York, which is about a four-hour drive north of New York City, 30-minute plane flight. It's in a place called the Finger Lakes and the Adirondacks, very beautiful area, a lot of snow. There's a very wealthy man there who owns 40 malls around the Northeast, very successful guy. His hometown is Syracuse, New York. He has decided, we'll see if it happens, but it's underway, to build in Syracuse, New York, the largest mall in the world. And it's, it's growing by the day. Right now, it's the 18th largest grossing mall in the United States. Why? Because everybody comes down from Canada, people come up from New York City, they come from the east, and it's a very good location on the way to Niagara Falls, if you've been to Niagara Falls. Very central location. He has committed to, as this is going to be his legacy project, his last project, he has committed to two principles in this mall. One is that it should be green, sustainable, that it should be environmentally friendly. And the second is that it's universally designed. And he's a very smart, shrewd businessman. Why is he pushing universal design? Because he has to get 30,000 people a day into this mall for it to make money. 
And he has to raise in this next phase $800 million for the next phase of development, for the third phase of development. And he believes, besides doing the right thing, if he goes to Wall Street, the bankers, and shows them that he can get in more people, people with disabilities and their families, the elderly, and others who otherwise would be shut out of this mall, that he's going to make more money. And he will actually get a preferential lending rate from Wall Street by implementing the universal design standards. Many of you know we all have family members or friends with disability. I do, some of you do as well. They will always say, if I can't get into this restaurant, they're not just losing my meal, they're losing my five family members that are going to come with me. So in Syracuse, New York, we are testing the concept of universal design and through the Global Universal Design Commission, we have developed standards which are essentially guidelines in which, different than the government regulations, they're meant to complement the government regulations, but they're meant to spur innovation. They're meant to force people to think about different ways that many people can be accommodated, which, as I say, oftentimes can affect positively usage by more than people with disabilities. The very simple example, of course, that everybody uses with curb cuts is it helps mothers pushing baby strollers as much as it helps people who use wheelchairs. Imagine that on a much broader scale. Now, the Global Universal Design Commission, which Shira asked me to talk about today, has been very successful. Brazil, as I said, wants to undertake the standards in use in the Olympics and the World Cup. But one of the companies we've been working with is a company called Procter & Gamble, a very large Fortune 500 company in the United States. They make Crest toothpaste. They make deodorant. They make all sorts of baby products. You brought Tide soap, Tide detergent. You know many of their products. So we started working with them on universal design in their 3,000 buildings because they believed that it would help them reduce workplace injury and would also help them in terms of the productivity of their employees. Interestingly, once we started talking with the vice chairman of the company, the light bulb went off and he said, you know, we make a lot of products and a lot of them are hard to open, a lot of them are hard to understand the instructions and to read for people with disabilities, people with cognitive disabilities, elderly. Can you work with us so that our consumer products are more user-friendly in a universally designed way. And this is a very exciting opportunity because so much of what we learn in society is from using these sorts of products, engaging with these sorts of activities. And we hope that we will apply universal design techniques to this as well. Lastly, I don't think I have too much time, Shira. Do Shira says I should end up. Lastly, I would say, as a member of the uh, commissioned report which focused on deinstitutionalization, community development that I talked about earlier, that Dr. Aminadav and others have uh, supported, which report will be released recently, of course, for this to be a successful effort, society will have to be more accessible. People will have to have more choice and independence. Otherwise, what's the point, really, of moving from an institution to being a prisoner in your own apartment when you really can't have access to the society as well. Elwin, for example, is one of the organizations that's been a terrific leader in this area and many others as well. So we look forward to the opportunity to work in partnership with organizations like yours, David, and others. And on behalf of Shira and myself, we would like to continue to work with you to further efforts on universal design and in the next phase of our products, of our research and our outreach, you'll see products today that we have developed and we are going to, in the next year, begin to work with communities to try to make them more accessible. So Shira, thank you very much. I tried to keep it brief because we're off schedule and I think that's it. Toda Rabah.